Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the March 27th Joint Metro North and Long Island Committee meeting. Um, if we could start off with uh, this morning's speakers. Susan? Good morning. We have 14 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Murray Bowden, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Morning. Uh, this is a new place for me to be speaking. I used to speak from over there. I'm in a wheelchair these days, and uh, I can still walk a little bit, but I can't go very far in the distance. Hi, I'm over here. Um, I've been here at a lot of meetings, and I've made a lot of suggestions, and my success rate has been rather low. So I realized I've been doing it wrong. There must be a better way of doing it. A couple of things I'm interested in, in safety. What makes a safe railroad? One of the things is that train horn that blows, it should warn people and not be something that's there all the time. You've got uh, public address at the stations and it says there's a train coming in six seconds, step back. Well, if a train's coming at 60 miles an hour and he blows the whistle, quarter of a mile down a train, who's going to get out of his way? Now, I can't do it anymore. Or if I could ever do it, I was kidding myself. All of you sitting at the table, those sitting behind me, it's your responsibility to notice this. You have access to people I don't. They haven't been listening to me, so I'm going to stop su suggesting it. I make each of you sitting at that table responsible to listen to that train horn. Is it sensible? Does it warn anybody? Has it any effect? Because if you repeat cry wolf all the time and there's no wolf, people stop listening. That's an example. The other example is the flashing red lights at railroad crossings. They were there before we had traffic lights. Does it make any sense in Danbury to have both traffic lights and red lights? Excuse me, Mr. Bowden, please conclude your remarks. The last thing I want to say, I want to thank everybody at Metro North and MTA who's taught me all this stuff. I'm not that smart. There are a lot of people who took the time to teach me. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by Kara Girl. Good morning, everyone. Charlton D'Souza from Passengers United. Um, the issues with disability on the Long Island Railroad, so many of our ADA passengers are being affected by the new Atlantic shuttle service. Uh, I, I, my heart goes out to them, and I am just appalled with the Long Island Railroad and with the MTA, with what you've done with these schedules. You're hurting the Long Island Railroad community. We're now four weeks into this. It's horrible, horrible. They have to be changed. Uh, the elevators are breaking down in Jamaica because they're owned by Port Authority. There's no accountability with Port Authority. And then all the air train passengers are bumping into everyone because the walkway at Jamaica Terminal which is owned by the Port Authority, has been broken for years now and was not fixed before this new plan went into effect. So when the Long Island Railroad made the decision to start the shuttle service for Brooklyn customers, they did not consider that the elevators are owned by the Port Authority, and that is a major ADA violation. I don't know why, the, you know why that wasn't figured out, why you guys didn't focus on that, but it's devastating. And so many people are falling down the stairs. People are running, running into each other, trampling. This is not the way to do it, guys. And a lot of the trains, I would say, are late, are coming five minutes late, 10 minutes late each day. So then what's the purpose of the schedule? It, the, it, the trains are not coming on at Jamaica on time. This has, these schedules have to be completely changed and redone again. And I'm going to keep saying that. 
until we get this thing right because people are paying $400 a month, $300. In some cases, $211 from Queens Village. So that has to be addressed. Um, I want to speak on my Metro North uh, time now. If I can, please, we can reset that clock. Thank you. So in terms of the Metro North issues that I want to talk about this month, um, the Metro North combo ticket, the new combo ticket you guys have, there's issues with the combo ticket um, because when you're trying to uh, put in Queens Village to New Haven or Jamaica to New Haven, it's not letting you put that up. It just says Grand Central. That's the only option on the ticket. So what I need clarification from Metro North and the railroad on is, is this ticket only for Grand Central? And then you show it to the conductor, um, you know, and then that's it. It's just valid at any station. That's what I need clarification on. And you guys should have posted a picture of the combo ticket. Um, we've gotten complaints from people that there's no MetroCard vending machines. Oh, not MetroCard, I'm sorry, Metro North. God help me. Metro North uh, vending machines down in the Grand Central area there where people come in off the Long Island Railroad trains. That would be helpful because if you're going, I believe, on the concourse over there, when you come out on the 47th Street side or the 46th Street side that takes you to all those tracks there, there's no vending <coughs> machines up there. Um, so you might want to look into that. That might make it easier. And then the other changes that have to be made, you know, with Metro North, is there needs to be a unified city ticket. We, a lot of people want that. So you can go from Fordham Road in the Bronx all the way to Jamaica on $5. That would be excellent. And in terms of the new Metro North schedules, I wanted to know, are they syncing up with Shoreline East trains? Because Shoreline East schedule is for March 6th. Uh, so I just wanted to know if the express trains in the evening, and there should be an express train in the morning, out of Grand Central that goes to New Haven. So if you're going to New London, you know, you can just connect with those trains. But guys, overall, we have to focus on accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Quito, followed by Bruce Hain. No, I'm sorry about that. It was Kara Girl, I apologize. Good morning, I'm Kara Girl, Planning and Advocacy Manager at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. Today marks a full month of new Long Island Railroad schedules, the biggest overhaul of the railroad's timetables yet. I'll start with the good. I'll start with the good. The opening of Grand Central Madison is a huge achievement. It's symbolic of a more unified system where riders can transfer between railroads and the subway under one roof. We've testified about the need for better wayfinding and signage and have seen improvements, but hope to see more as the task force continues its work. But for riders to benefit from Grand Central Madison, getting the service plan right should be the top priority. We've certainly heard praise and excitement about time savings for riders traveling to East Midtown, but Grand Central service shouldn't come at the expense of other riders, many of whom had a very difficult first few weeks of new schedules made worse by frequent signal and capacity issues at Jamaica. We appreciate the railroad's willingness to make adjustments, including increasing frequencies to Brooklyn, diverting some Grand Central trains back to Penn, and lengthening some trains. These changes have made a difference, and we've seen a bit of decline in frustrated commuter complaints since. But issues remain, and there is work to be done. This includes adjusting schedules to increase service to Penn on weekends and nights with major events, fixing capacity issues at Jamaica, improving the timeliness of trains, and working with the Port Authority to fix Jamaica's elevators. Every effort should be made to restore timed connections, the lack of which has frustrated riders who may miss connecting trains by a matter of seconds and have to wait 20 or 30 minutes or more for another train. We also understand rolling stock limitations and hope that orders of new cars can be expedited. Most important is making sure that riders feel heard throughout this major change. We hope you will create a formal system for riders to submit feedback and get responses. This could be an online form, or as we've called for since last June, branch by branch public meetings. Riders know the system best and taking their concerns seriously will only serve to improve the railroad for all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Quito, followed by Bruce Hain. Hello. Good morning, guys. My name is Andy Quito, and I want to talk about the Long Island Railroad safety. It, um, there's been a lot of attacks recently on on, on uh, MTA conductors, and 
and people not paying the fare, which also causes delays on trains everywhere in the system. So they need to be extremely uh, uh, more security into the station. And this is the one of the reasons why we need to watch out for John Mitchell at Mineola Station. Because uh, this guy's been acting out again. And I hope the police can look one more bit into this guy and have him arrested. Because, and, and second, now with the with the new schedules, can you have at least some Monto train stop at Mineola? Especially those that are going to Patchogue. At least you can pick up that guy without having him to come to my neighborhood, to my neck of the woods. So yeah, that's all I got to say. Let's talk about the loan out of revenue schedules. It's been a mess for the start. Every single day, there's always trains coming in late. People running on the stairs. It's causing a huge safety issue. All right? I can't, can't do this anymore. Can't take this anymore with these new schedules, man. Every day, there's always signal problems or trains breaking down. It's just absolute chaos. So I, I, I'm demanding you guys to, to, to fix up the schedules and, and, and to make the LIRR better again. Because the, the old schedule was much, much better than this. It's been a month of hell on the Long Island Railroad. And I hope you guys fix it. You know what? That's all I got to say. Get your act together. And please, do the right thing for us, right? Because we're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month to the Long Island Railroad. And this is one of the reasons why people don't want to come back to work in the city because of uh, antics like this. Thank you so much. And get him arrested, John Mitchell. No, thank you. Our next speaker is Bruce Hain, followed by John Mitchell. Uh, good morning, board members and chair. Um, I want to make it perfectly clear now I want to speak for four minutes with your permission to both uh, this joint committee and the CPOC, even though uh, some of them are not here. But I would like to try and do it all at once because maybe it'll make more sense that way. Um, uh, Queenslink is, uh, is becoming a, a, a force. And um, it's important for you to know that because Although, in either case, everyone must agree the, 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 the Rockaway Beach, ban Beach Branch is a disgrace. It's an international disgrace. If you see it from, um, from uh, Liberty Avenue, from the A train, why, there's almost nothing like it. Um, but uh, uh, the trouble is the Long Island Railroad needs that property. And the capacity problems you're experiencing now are, uh, well, you have to know, you know, they put bridges after the Rockaway Beach branch coming towards Woodside, bridges on either side. That's where you could have six tracks there. And the idea is to come, I'm taking four minutes, remember. The idea is, I wish they'd get a yellow light or something instead of that stupid beeping. Um, is so you could come from Jamaica and have six tracks minimum all the way from Jamaica through, um, uh, oh, what is it called by the J train? I, I lived there, uh, Richmond Hill. Um, through that beautiful station at Richmond Hill. It's a beautiful station. It's a wonders, wonderful station. They need it there. And uh, they've asked for it in so many words uh, uh, at these meetings. Then you go to uh, 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 Glendale Junction. I've designed a beautiful station there. It's quite an infrastructure problem, pr project, but you've got to have it to have six tracks. And the, the Pennsylvania Railroad planned this before East side access was even thought of, but you have a lack of capacity. You don't have enough uh, train capacity now, and that's what's causing the scheduling problems, and that's the way they operate. They create, uh, so you need that six tracks into the city that was planned back in the 1930s and partially built, and now it's running to seed. And I think you ought to see to it. That's important for the Long Island Railroad. Now, what else? Oh, this, um, 
you know, these uh, crossover tracks by Elmont, who builds switches like that? The, the things are, are 750 feet long. That's, that's 150 mile an hour of what Long Island Railroad train goes that fast? How come you do that? I got to say it, ladies and gentlemen, you have very interesting discussions. They're brilliant, but you're incompetent. It's, it's a disgrace. And, you know, you've got, you've got to have some, the, the way they do it is like Eastside Access. At that time, 30 years ago, they could have come in 59th Street uh, before, um, you know, when they took down the Coliseum and built uh, Time Warner, before they built Time Warner. You could have had a station there and then gone, uh, had, had surface tracks down to Grand Central that could have been very easily connected then. So why this nonsense? They perform a miracle. They want to perform a Excuse miracle. Excuse me, Mr. Haynes, please conclude your remarks. All right, thank you very much. And um, I hope you'll take some of this seriously, but I suspect you won't. And we'll have to try something, uh, maybe, uh, anyway. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Michno, followed by Yuki Endo. Hello. Good morning. I appreciate the monumental work the LRRR has done in regards to the opening of Grand Central, and I'm glad to see, finally, more frequent off-peak and reverse-peak service to Ronkonkoma. I do echo the concerns of the many who have had their commutes changed for the worse, and I want to express that we need direct service to Atlantic Terminal during the rush hours. The renovation of the Mineola station is nearly complete, yet there are no seats. The waiting room is the only place with benches, but it closes at 1.30 p.m., and isn't even open on weekends, which is rather ridiculous considering some other stations like Rockville Center have their waiting rooms open later and on weekends. I see people having to sit on the ground. All the other stations get benches except for us. How come? This is not a good way to treat passengers who use the Mineola LIRR station, especially for the elderly and disabled. Bad enough you somehow built a new overpass in the middle of the station with no elevator, even though that's required by ADA. Lastly, I want to express my disappointment that we are not seeing any expansion of service between Hicksville and the Montauk line. We have a number of Montauk trains that use the main line and central branch, particularly on weekends, yet run express between Jamaica and Babylon, depriving main line riders in Nassau the opportunity to travel points east on the South Shore. This will be made even more ridiculous in the summer season when many folks who live here will drive out east, even though there's a train that could take them there that will sail just past their communities. All trains that pass through this way should stand a stop and it's built immediately. And this includes Babylon. All Montauk trains should stop there to allow intra-island riders. The new schedule will still ignore the growing group of passengers, this growing group of passengers. Uh, lastly, I just want to say the personal attacks on me are completely unwarranted, and it's disgraceful that you tolerate this. It just shows how corrupt you are, and I'm very disappointed to see this continue. That is all I've got to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yuki Endo, followed by Judith Lacanti. Someone will be reading Mr. Endo's remarks. Allen. Good morning. My name is Yuki Endo and I'm with Passenger United. On September 16th, 2023, there will be a vegan, vegan Dale festival at Randall's Island. We need X80 bus to and from because M35 bus get dangerously overcrowded and sometimes people going back to Manhattan get stranded for two to four hours, which shown on video on last year. For Long Island Railroad, I'm no, I'm no longer happy with Brooklyn shuttle during rush hours, three to four hours on all branches need to serve Atlantic Terminal and restore time connection at Jamaica Mineola. Need benches because lean seats are not good and 
During mainline shutdown in Nassau, we need shuttle buses between Floral Park and Hicksville. For buses, both Brooklyn and Queens bus redesign need leave B2, B6, B15, B17, B24, B26, B35 Limited, B36, B38 Limited, B47, B48, B49 Limited, B61, B62, B68, B69, B100, BM1 through 5, Q22, Q23, Q31, Q35, Q41, Q48, Q53, Select Bus, Q11, Q101, Q110, Q114, QM135, Express Bus 27, 28, 37, and 38 buses alone. I am grateful New York Assembly Senate agreed to pass fix the MTA package to freeze fare and free bus services to New York City and hope Governor Hochul signs bill. I do not support congested pricing because many of my vegan friends will rely on cars along with public transit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judith Aconte, followed by Iris Kelly. Good morning, everyone. My name is Judith, and I'm a Brooklyn-bound LIRR commuter. The issue I would like to address is the new schedule that does not include full service to Atlantic Terminal. This change has been a big inconvenience. There are late arrivals and late departures. I am not able to make it to connecting trains, and also Long Island Railroad staff that are on the platform are not communicating well to riders that are lost and confused by the changes that are occurring without warning. I do understand the concept behind the Grand Central Madison Station, but I think that the new schedule should, ha should be revised and be mindful to the riders that need to get to Brooklyn. And that Brooklyn-bound riders, and that Brooklyn-bound, sorry, and that there are more Brooklyn-bound riders than Grand Central riders. Um, I, my only suggestion is that you guys revise the schedule that would include full service to Atlantic bound to Atlantic terminal on all lines. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Iris Kelly, followed by Andrew Pollack. Hello. Um, I have problems with this railroad changeover is that we have uh, connections for, um, Usually we get off in the, from uh, to, um, Jamaica Station. Now you have to make us go from track two all the way to track 12, which is not good. I try going there and then come downstairs. It just makes the very bottom. The train's just pulling out. It's not good. They need to put these trains on back on track three and leave them alone where they were. Everything was good before. Even have connections coming in. You don't need track 12 for Brooklyn coming in and out. I always had, we've no problem, come from the terminal, come into where we get a connection across the way, be able to get our train going out to where I have to go, including things going out to Long Island, all I'll do is cross the platform, or it's right behind the other train coming in. You don't need this sort of going all the way over. Those trains, track 11 and 12, should be towards, for going towards Manhattan. Nothing to do with the Brooklyn trains or the, any connecting trains that we do need. I've had problems coming from one train over to the other. I even uh, coming into Brooklyn, losing a package, just coming from the track 12, going over track 8, crossing over. It's not good, it's not easy, and it's very hard for people just to travel in these days, not like it used to be. It was so much easier the other way it was. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Pollack. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, Kathy, and good morning, everyone. So a couple things that I'm gonna close out the first quarter with. Number one, a month ago, just 30 days ago, I was at Grand Central Madison, and I was very impressed by the new station. The only complaint that I have is the long escalator, but that's really the only complaint I really do have in terms of the station overall. So the next thing I want to address is the situation at Mineola. So there's two concerns that I have. Number one, the Long Island Railroad is violating the Americans with Disabilities Act by not providing benches on the platform. It is supposedly called, and I quote from Mr. Mitch now, 
leaners. Yes, leaners. How is that acceptable? And then you keep the waiting room open until 1.30 in the afternoon and close down weekends? Stations in the Babylon branch have longer hours for their waiting rooms. You know, you know how is this acceptable? I, I, I don't get it. And also, I want to mention something. April 9th, Sunday, Easter. Now that Grand Central Madison is open, can you guys please put more trains on Easter morning, April 9th, for people who are going to be attending Easter Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Midtown that morning? Maybe divert some Penn Station trains to Grand Central that morning so that way people coming from Long Island have a one-seat ride to go to church on Easter. So... One more thing, the combo tickets on Metro North and Long Island Railroad, when I tried purchasing a ticket from Bayside to Fordham, there was no option for that. So the TVMs need to be updated immediately for the Metro North Long Island Railroad combo ticket, especially now that the Yankees home opener is on Thursday afternoon against the Giants. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for hearing me out, and I expect to speak again in April. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Sally Wolf. Good morning, Kathy, and good morning, Long Island Railroad slash Metro North Committee. Exciting news from uh, that we have to report. Our uh, Massachusetts governor just reported that she will be nominated. Our former president, Phil and to the Massachusetts uh, MBTA to be the head of the Massachusetts Transportation Authority over there. So we should congratulate Phil N on his new uh, commitment over there in Massachusetts. But let's get to business. As a Brooklyn Knight myself, I'm not satisfied with the schedules. We only have one train to and from Freeport. No trains to and from Far Rockaway because what if something happens on the A train? What will be the travel alternatives if something happens on the A train? We have zero trains on the Long Beach train, on the Long Beach branch. We have zero trains on the Ronkonkoma branch. So we have literally zero trains on the Hampstead branch. So we have no connections to the island. So Kathy, could we have the trains that we had prior opening of Grand Central Madison? And uh, could I get two minutes regarding Metro North Matters? Uh, Kathy, when we uh, opened the uh, Train 10 app, there's a glitch. Because if, we, if a passenger is going to buy the CE ticket, uh, there's an epic fail in there. Because... If a passenger is going to buy a ticket, let's use uh, Grand Central and, for, and Woodlawn, for example. And let's assume if the passenger is going to travel between those two stations. The passenger is going to see the off-peak and the city ticket at the same time. And we're going to see seven seventy five and five dollars at the same time. Which option is the passenger going to use? Let's fix that, shall we? Because which option are we going to use? Because I have seen that myself, and there's two seventy five difference between those two options and it happens 
and the Long Island Railroad side as well. And we don't want to have that same, we, we don't want to have that discrepancy in both railroads. And we don't want to this persuade passengers to spend seven seventy five off peak and disenfranchise passengers to spend five dollars with the city ticket. So let's do more spending less. I'll see you guys in transit. Thank you. Our next excuse me, our next speaker is Sally Wolf, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Hello again, I'm Sally Wolf. I live in Flatiron. I'm once again here to share my idea for selectively masking specific cars or areas of cars on trains. And I was actually thinking about you all while leading a client innovation workshop last Tuesday and thinking about what usually holds a company back from trying something new. And high level, here's what I see are the three areas from testing new ideas. One, it's far too costly. The return on the investment isn't there. There's no way to test cheaply. Two, there's no interest. Consumer demand is far too low. Or three, something that feels similar has been tried before. And because that didn't succeed, there's no willingness to adjust based on the learnings and retry. So thinking about where we are today, the cost of this idea is so low, it's almost non-existent, especially relative to all the other things that I'm hearing people voice here today. This can be accomplished by simple paper signs. Two, there is demand, and it's not only from immunocompromised people like me. I have so many friends who are healthy who tell me the only place they still mask is mass transit. But even though a sizable minority of us are masking, we are spread out across entire trains. It makes no sense. We would prefer to be in the company, a lot of us anyway, not everyone, but certainly me, of other people masked. So the cost is low and demand is sufficient. So let's talk about number three, history. I understand and I am so empathetic that there's no appetite for conversations about masks anymore. You're tired, I'm tired, I get it, conductors were treated badly, but this is not the same idea. That, you, that, that mask mandate for everyone didn't work because people lost freedom. But this lets everyone self-select and lets everyone win. So please let us all ride and feel more safe and pilot this as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jesse Figueroa, followed by Alita Dupree. Good morning. I'm back. <laughs> um, the only concern is with the commuter railroads is Atlantic Terminal. And I would like to know in the waiting room area, how come the power outlets are locked? People need to still charge their cell phones while waiting for a train or the subway, and it's not fair. That's one concern. And second concern, you still have homeless people and panhandling all over the whole building, and it's gone out of control. And same thing with the platforms. They're still throwing food on the tracks and, and, and harassing other commuters because of, of the stores next door and all that. And, 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 and other people said with the scheduling, please, please, please. Just, just beef up the scheduling and please um, beef up the uh, MTA patrol, police patrols, please. It, because pe people need to get to work or school, see their families and all that good stuff. And that part, and Grand Central Madison is real nice, but still. We, it's got it's got need more improvements with these escalators and the whole Grand Central Terminal itself and, and elevators too and all that. It's still dirty. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Alita Dupree. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning uh, to the chair. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. Thought I'd save the best for last. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about railroad today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, using Grand Central Madison. I think in April I'm going to be there. Um, I'm looking forward to trying out those long escalators. I've been practicing in the central subway of San Francisco 
And it kind of looks like Grand Central Madison. It's not as big, but, but I certainly think there are some common elements. Uh, so uh, I think I'm in store for something good. I can figure out how to make all these things work, the schedules. And I did practice the train time app today. And I saw that you have a phone login. That, that, that's very, very helpful. Because uh, it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of passwords for uh, uh, infrequently used apps and uh, uh, e even with a password manager. So uh, th th thank you uh, for that uh, with phone login. And uh, I hope we can, as I've said before, that we can get the uh, schematics and plans for Omni on the railroads up because uh, I'm still having trouble imagining uh, what it's going to look like on uh, 67 tracks of Grand Central Terminal and then Grand Central Madison, all these other stations. So uh, I believe it's going to work. Uh, I've just not seen anything like this before, but that's going to make my life easier. And uh, Omni in general, uh, I think, is going to be a good thing for the railroads. And uh, I think we have to work on our electricity and get that central branch uh, electrified uh, so we can move away from... Uh, diesel fuel. Uh, the time has come to try new things, and I think we can make this work. So I'm looking forward to using this system, and I thank you. Thank you. Chair, that concludes the public comment session. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to this morning's speakers. Um, just as a reminder, for this meeting, Metro North Rail has the lead um, for this joint meeting. Um, I, I do want to make a quick comment. I know at our last MTA board meeting, Commissioner Miranda had talked about looking at optional masking in subway cars, if it's possible to also include commuter rail to see if that's something that we could look into. Sure, we can look at that. Thank you. Moving on to our joint railroad administrative items, um, everybody has uh, had an opportunity to look at the meeting minutes from February 21st. Um, are there any corrections or omissions? If not, I move to approve the minutes. Uh, second, Commissioner Glucksman, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Meeting minutes are approved. Moving on to work plans. Um, Kathy, are there any changes to the work plans? Actually, there are changes this month for both the Metro North and the Long Island Railroad work plans. The diversity report are now the diversity reports for both railroads. Excuse me, are now moved to April. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to the agency uh, president's report. Thank you, Chair. A lot has certainly happened since our last committee meeting. Before running through some of the issues that we have seen with the new Grand Central Madison service plan, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge a terrible incident that took place last Wednesday when two of our Long Island Railroad conductors were brutally attacked while trying to collect fares from a male passenger. The assault took place west of Jamaica at around 10.30 a.m. on a West Hempstead to Atlantic terminal train. The alleged perpetrator exited the train at East New York and ran off. We were all relieved to hear that the alleged perpetrator was apprehended within 24 hours due to some fine police work. Our frontline train crews are dedicated and they work very, very hard to serve the public and we are appalled and we are outraged when heinous crimes like this one occur. Long Island Railroad Transportation Supervision holds weekly safe strategy meetings with MTA PD officials and union leadership, and the PD has implemented its new train patrol program to provide a safe and secure environment for our customers and our employees. I'm happy to report that both employees are at home recovering from their injuries, and we certainly wish them a full and speedy recovery. But I don't know if you have anything to say to this one at this point at the juncture. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have, a, I have a few comments I need to make, and uh, if we're moving ahead a little bit, so be it. I think this is incredibly important. And, and some of the remarks that I'm going to share right now uh, are coming from General Chairman Anthony Simon uh, as well, because he's been very close to the process. You know, this is just, this was a, a horrific assault. Uh, I could share some photos, uh, which are kind of private, but we have permission with any board member that would like to see what these grown men look like. Um, <clears throat> This is just one bad incident of many. We're not even addressing all of the minor incidents, and I don't consider them minor, where it's just a slap or a kick or a punch. Uh, we have a lot of people that are currently out due to assaults. 
I couldn't thank the chief and his his, his folks enough for getting this guy uh, as quickly as as they did, and to be there to support us. We had three union officials in in Brooklyn court uh, into Friday morning, including our general chairman, uh, to to eye down the judge and to do whatever they possibly can to to uh, get the right thing done. And they did that night, only for this individual to walk the next day. Uh, it has to stop. We all have connections to judges, to DAs, to political people, to our, to our legislators up in Albany. We have to stop. We can't have signs on our trains that say you, you could be convicted and, and, and jailed for seven years when people don't even do seven hours. Enough is enough. And, and, and quite frankly, I'm not pointing blame at anybody because I know nobody wants this to happen, but it is. I've been speaking on this board for since 2007, at least two or three times a year, dealing with elevated assaults and saying how it has to stop. And everybody agrees, and everybody says the right thing. But I'm starting to question, like, the actions, some of our own responsibilities. And I just I want to go through a few things, right? What puts our frontline crews at risk, right? We have ticket fare collection policies on our branches that we've been saying have been confusing. The Atlantic ticket, the city ticket, when can we apply them? When can we step them up? The inability to utilize e-tickets properly on the Atlantic branch, which our members have been telling us and we've been communicating to help things. The service, I mean, we hear, speak, we hear our speakers talking about the Atlantic service. We can't ignore it. That's a problem. I, I understand that we rebuilt this railroad to accommodate a major project, and I'm sure it's all going to work out in the end, but for now, people aren't ha happy about it. Who's getting the brunt of that? I'm, I'm wondering. Who's getting the brunt of that? Our crews. There, we, have, we have ongoing questions about the bike policy and, and the use of scooters and batteries and all this stuff on the train. None of it has been addressed at this point. Again, not pointing figures, fingers, just saying enough is enough. We have to deal with this. These are all things that are creating the tension. Our riders are frustrated, and our conductors can't get beat up for it especially at a time when we're motivating them, auditing them, following them to make sure they're collecting fares. How do I motivate somebody to collect a fare when these two guys, all they did was say ticket please and got beaten and got beaten? So I don't know what more to say. We have issues with uh, the ADL policies and extending credit to riders, which isn't even consistent on both railroads and we've been asking to make them consistent. The MTA police are, are, are helping and agreeing that we need to be able to remove people from trains that, don't want, that are not willing to pay. What's the debate about? You don't go into a store and steal food. You don't go anywhere for free. So when are we going to hold people accountable for a ride? And, and we have to do a better job at it. I, I can go on and on forever. You, uh, you have to feel my passion. I don't say much here, but... My conductors, our organizations, crews, frontline workers don't deserve this. We have employees now that don't want to work here anymore. They don't want to work here. They, their wives and, and husbands don't want them working here. So I implore this board to do everything in their power to look at this more closely. Let's not wait for the next serious incident to occur to talk about it again and create more fluff. Let's give the chief the people that he needs. Let's give him the troops and the officers. Let's get people on as many trains as we can, and let's get rid of them, and let's put them in jail. Joe, I mean, can I go back to him? It would be helpful I could go back to the Please, remarks and then maybe do this at the end. I understand. I actually do, too. I mean, you know, Vinny has raised some very serious and important points here today. The security of our employees is obviously paramount. We've, we've established, I think, an excellent partnership with Chief Muller and his team, and they've done a lot over the course of the last several months under his leadership to improve the onboard presence of police officers. Um, I, I, I really have nothing to say other than, you know, you have my personal commitment to ensuring that all of our employees on both railroads who deal with the public every day under certain certain circumstances that can be very tense, very difficult. You have our full commitment to ensuring that they are as safe as they possibly can be. We want them to want to come to work. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Kathy, uh, again. Oh, okay. Oh, David. More, <laughs> Mr. Max on. Okay. Yes. We need more law enforcement 
police officers. No two ways about it. No uh, window dressing. Ten men here, 20 people here. We need a strong force, and that is a deterrent, whether it's Long Island Railroad or Metro North. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Let's uh, let President Rinaldi go continue with our presentation okay. and then we can perfect thank you so comment. much okay so now we get to turn to something also controversial which is the grand central madison operating plan um the plan was introduced on february 27th never before has the long island railroad offered this much service and to so many places the benefits to the region are many and we look forward to seeing the project reach its full potential that being said however the rollout of the new schedules came with some growing pains Despite past surveys and estimates, we anticipated that some adjustments were going to need to be made once we had a first-hand look at where customers were going and on which trains. In short order, we realized that the new Grand Central Madison service was going to take some time to fully take hold, and the customers were opting for PEN over GCM by an approximate 70-30 split at first. Although more customers are beginning to opt for GCM, some trains to PEN were initially extremely crowded. The new schedules and the elimination of scheduled transfers at Jamaica, especially during the morning peak, were a big change for our customers and for many an unwelcome one. Though overall service increased significantly, customers who had become used to one seat rides at the same basic time for many years, sometimes decades, now had transfers at Jamaica, many of which were up and over transfers. As you've heard this morning, many of our Brooklyn-bound riders were unhappy with the new shuttle service on tracks 11 and 12, as well as the initial frequency of service. Since the rollout, we've been monitoring ridership, we've been keeping a close eye on conditions at stations, especially Jamaica, and we've been listening to customer feedback. Based upon what we've seen and what we've heard, the following adjustments have been made so far. On day one, it was evident that certain trains needed relief ASAP. The very next day, February 28th, we were able to add a pair of cars on three morning trains with very high day one ridership. We spent that first week focused on train loading, early and emerging travel patterns, and how customers were navigating their new commutes at our stations, especially at Jamaica. Using the data that we gathered, we added three Atlantic, sh Atlantic Terminal shuttle trains Excuse me, the following Monday, March 6th, bringing AM peak Jamaica to Brooklyn service intervals from 12 minutes down to 10. We also added cars to 15 high ridership trains that day. The next day, those 10-minute peak Brooklyn service intervals were reduced to less than eight on average. In addition, we've added dedicated platform controllers to assist customers on tracks 11 and 12, from which most, of the Brook from which most Brooklyn shuttle trains depart. The goal for the morning rush on the Brooklyn shuttle, when conditions allow, is to have another train already platformed and open to customers once one train closes its doors and departs Jamaica for Brooklyn. Trains are expected to hold up to two additional minutes for connecting customers transferring from other platforms. Beginning Monday, March 13th, we diverted four daily peak GCM trains over to Penn and also added Ronkonkoma and Central Islip stops to 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. peak trains that originally, initially originated, excuse me, or terminated at Brentwood, further increasing one-seat options for our very popular Mid-Suffolk hubs. That same day, we also lengthened four additional trains and introduced adjusted stopping patterns at a number of stations system-wide based upon ridership data. Last Monday, March 20th, we added a 7:11 a.m. Mineola stop to a westbound Huntington to Penn Station train, thereby closing a large gap in direct Penn service from this popular mainline station. Beginning today, we're adding a car to the 4:22 p.m. train from Hunters Point Avenue to Port Jefferson. In addition to adding trains, diverting trains, or adding cars to trains, we've maximized the number of LIR staff at key stations to answer questions and help smooth the transition for customers as much as possible. We've established more predictable platform track assignments at Jamaica, maximizing the number of cross-platform transfers we can offer within operational constraints. We've directed train crews to make targeted onboard announcements encouraging use of all available seats. We've made full use of our Jamaica Control Center to closely monitor and evaluate ridership conditions and operations via real-time passenger loading data. In the past, we would have to wait for a much slower system of doing manual in-person train counts to get that sort of information. We've maximized our social media reach and the use of digital screens, posting all sorts of helpful travel tips, advising customers, for example, uh, about uh, the possibility of transferring at stations east of Jamaica. 
Our service information office has kept customers informed and up to date with service changes and other important messaging. As the result of all of these changes, service delivery has stabilized and OTP is regularly back in the 90s. Some trains are still more crowded than others, but only on rare occasions do we have peak trains exceeding 90% capacity. I am very proud of all of our employees who recognized the gravity of the situation and responded, especially to our transportation and service planning employees who have been working very long hours and weekends towards providing immediate relief wherever possible. We also have a host of volunteers out there on platforms who have been getting a lot of flack from our customers. I really thank them for their service and for stepping up. We've tried to be nimble in spite of all the operational challenges we face and adapted when possible to address concerns from the public as quickly as possible. Actually, I don't want to leave this paragraph without also giving a shout out to stations employees who've been out there every day and really helping our customers uh, you know, get where they need to go. Certainly adding a second track to the Ronkonkoma branch and a third mainline track between Hicksville and Floral Park provides the railroad with all sorts of flexibility and the ability to expand service to never before dreamed of levels. Bottom line, in spite of the initial challenges we faced, we are thrilled to see that people are using the new service. Average weekday ridership has increased in each of the first three weeks of the new schedule, as well as total system-wide OTP. While the increases in total ridership have been modest but steady so far, we did see the highest one-day ridership total of the year on Thursday, March 16th, with, al with almost 210,000 customers, and that record was short-lived as we topped 213,000 customers just this past Tuesday, the highest weekday ridership count since the start of the pandemic, surpassing the previous post-COVID record, which had been set on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving of last year. We really appreciate the patience and adaptability of our customers, but we know very well that this work is not done. It is a dynamic process. We are going to continue to monitor our service and boarding patterns, and we will continue to make adjustments that are necessary along the way. We will continue to update our ridership at every turn. Turning to other Long Island Railroad matters, I want to discuss the uh, Cherry Valley Avenue bridge replacement. It's getting a lift and a new life. The 152-year-old bridge was raised 12 inches per weekend over three consecutive weekends earlier in the month. This past weekend, Cathedral Avenue crossing at the west end of Garden City Station was replaced as well. The new precast steel bridge will sit higher than the state DOT 14-foot minimum standard for clearance and be moved into place this coming weekend, the fifth and final of the project. This particular bridge suffered a whopping 110 truck strikes since the start of 2018, by far the most of any Long Island Railroad span. Projects like this one are instrumental in maintaining the system to a state of good repair, cutting down on maintenance costs, and improving service reliability. As previously, Hempstead Branch Service would have to come to a halt every time this bridge was struck in order to await inspection. It's important to note as well that this is the first major track work program performed under the new schedules. In early March, we unveiled the all-new Mineola Station, a popular mainline stop and transit hub, and one of the last stations to be renovated under the Long Island Railroad Expansion Project. MTA CND Chief Jamie Torres Springer and his team worked closely with the community to usher this key station into the 21st century, introducing widened platform and new pedestrian, new pedestrian overpasses, improved accessibility, and modern amenities for residents to enjoy, including a new and visually stunning art installation just in time for Women's History Month. While folks around the world celebrate the heroism of Amelia Earhart, and rightfully so, not nearly as many people know the name Bessica, Bessie Raich, who started it all for female aviators as the first woman in the United States credited with piloting an airplane solo. The flight took place on the Hempstead Plains back in 1910 in a plane that she and her husband built at their Mineola home, and her achievement will henceforth be forever immortalized by a Donald Lipsky statue alongside the westbound Mineola platform. Looking at the statue, you'll see that Bessie is holding a special little pal named Roxy, himself a Long Island Railroad pioneer. In 1901, Roxy wandered into our Garden City station to escape a thunderstorm, and the station master adopted him as his station dog. However, the pup began, uh, kept boarding all of the trains. His wandering spirit led to his eventually becoming the beloved four-legged mascot of the Long Island Railroad, making friends wherever he went, including President Teddy Roosevelt, with whom Roxy would occasionally travel up to Oyster Bay in his private car. 
With all the new regional connectivity and travel options brought on by the new combo ticket and a common terminal at Grand Central, it's a whole lot easier to use the Long Island Railroad and Metro North to discover the best of our region. And we hope our customers will channel their inner Roxy and let their spirit of adventure soar. I want to make... Uh, give out a special thanks to MTA Arts and Designs Director Sandra Bloodworth and her team for allowing Bessie and Roxy's story to be told in such a prominent and lasting way. A little bit about ridership. In February of 2023, Long Island Railroad served 4.3 million customers, an increase of 35.1% from last February, representing 65.7% of February 2019's ridership. St. Patrick's Day ridership gave Long Island Railroad a 9% bump over normal Friday ridership. Metro North served 3.95 million customers in February of 2023, a ridership increase of 43.7% from last February, representing 63.6% .6 of ridership in February of 2019. Our Metro North St. Patrick's Day ridership was robust with an estimated 11,000 additional customers using Metro North to get them to and from the festivities, a 21% increase over normal Friday ridership. A couple of upcoming service notes. With the arrival of spring comes, of course, the return of baseball. Opening day at Yankee Stadium is this Thursday, March 30th, and Metro North is ready with its popular trains to the game, extra stop on Hudson Line trains, and shuttle trains from Grand Central Terminal. We also have comparable service, actually it's not comparable, similar service, for fans of NYCFC soccer for all 32 of their remaining home games at the stadium. Mets will at points service will resume once again with the Mets home opener at City Field on April 6th, and Long Island Railroad will operate early release trains on April 5th and 7th, respectively, for Passover and Good Friday. Turning now to Metro North, which was ostensibly in the lead, but it doesn't feel that way. <laughs> um, schedules have changed on the Hudson, Harlem, and New Haven lines, effective yesterday, March 26th, and will remain in effect through Saturday, June 10th. In addition to the aforementioned Yankee Stadium event service, the new schedule reflects hourly weekend service on the Hudson Line to support several significant state of good repair infrastructure improvements. Some minor PM peak weekday adjustments on the Harlem Line to alleviate station congestion at Southeast. And the continuation of the amended New Haven Line weekday schedule, resulting from the elevator escalator replacement project being undertaken by CDOT at Stamford. There are no changes to weekday train frequencies. For full details, be sure to log on to our website or check the train time app for schedules, trip planning, and ticket purchasing information. Maintaining the safety and cleanliness of the right-of-way is of the utmost importance, and the expansive Grand Central Terminal train shed is one of those places where debris can pile up quickly, uh, if not for regular maintenance. This is why our crews regularly assess the priority areas and perform semi-annual cleanings to eliminate potential hazards and prevent track fires. One such cleaning took place recently over some two dozen of the neediest train shed tracks, an effort coordinated by the Metro North Office of System Safety, various operating departments, including transportation and both MOW and MOV. Using the safest methods possible, 23 volunteers cleaned along the roadbeds and adjacent third rails all the way up to the bumping posts. All in all, the team collected 83 ta trash bags worth of common debris plus two one-ton containers and an additional 550 pounds worth of construction debris. Big thanks go out to all the participants for their commendable collaboration and their dedication to system safety. Finally, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're unfamiliar with the Grand Central Terminal Fire Brigade. It's a battle-tested team of emergency response professionals who's happy to work behind the scenes to ensure the safety of the terminal, the train shed, and every customer and employee therein. However, when there's a problem, whether it's a fire alarm, a medical aid case, you name it, they're out in front and very often the first on the scene. They did it over 1,100 times last year alone. This 24-7 operation handles fire prevention, things like fire life system inspection and co-compliance, evacuation training, and system maintenance. They're also the keepers of the command center during all alarms, big and small, and if needed, they provide fire response capability. Every member of the team is a certified New York State EMT. This brave squad just doubled in size because it now covers Grand Central Madison as well. It made perfect sense to expand the team that's already in place in the terminal, knows the drill, and knows the players, having responded to 1,133 fire and EMS callouts in 2022 with an average response time of only 2 minutes 28 seconds. It's an impressive work by an impressive group of pros. 
Finally, for Women's History Month, few things in life give me greater personal satisfaction than to see my fellow women in transportation hitting new heights and blazing trails never before possible. Whether they're in crew uniforms, executive suites, or in hard hats, I'm honored to call them my trusted colleagues. At Metro North and Long Island Railroad, we work hard to attract and promote the best and brightest from all backgrounds to leadership positions, and I'm proud to say that the top spots of many Long Island Railroad and Metro North departments are held by women. So in this room, you have Shelly and Lori, heads of the system safety groups at both railroads. You have Susan, general counsel. You have Ziona from C&D. Um, not present here, you have Yvonne Hill Donald, chief uh, administrative officer. Beth Sullivan, chief transportation officer at Long Island. Teresa Dorsey, chief stations officer at Long Island. And Kelly Coughlin, who's the head of uh, labor relations at Long Island. These are just an incredible group of women. I salute them today. I want to commend them for their excellence and their service. Our region is much richer for their efforts, and I'm proud of each and every one of them. That concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. I believe Commissioner Brigman had a couple of questions or comments. Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chair. Um, first, just to follow up on some of the things that Vinny said, and maybe even take it a little bit further. Um, we got to do something to prevent these assaults on our people. Um, there has been a president established that we could do a lifetime ban. We've done it to somebody that was harassing one of our people. Um, I saw the video. It was on News 12 on Long Island. A guy like that should not be allowed to ride on our trains. And we should have the right to ban somebody and give him a lifetime ban. Right now, he's free. He can hop on a Long Island Railroad train anytime he so desires. This could happen this afternoon. And we have to do whatever we can do within our power to prevent this. Um, a couple of other things that Vinny had brought up. Um, the ADL thing. Uh, that's been a bug up my butt for 20 years, maybe, because I had seen a copy of an ADL when you used to have them by hand, uh, written, printed. And I'd see guys who'd skated 20 times. And it's why didn't they arrest these people? Because they were very afraid to hold up a train. And I think the policy should be, if you get somebody that's, they, they do it electronically now, right? The yes. ADLs. Yes. But if you pull up a guy and he's done it five times, six times, yeah, have, have MTA P, PD meet him at Jamaica and arrest him. It's theft of service. I mean, you know, we, we call it fair evasion because we all want to be politically correct and soothe everything. But it's theft of service. They're stealing from the MTA. They're stealing from our fellow customers. And we need to take a harder line on that. Uh, another thing he mentioned about the uh, no, no MTA policy on battery-operated trains. Um, this is something that I've been pushing. Scooters. scooters. The scooters. This is something that I've been pushing for for the last several months. We can't wait till there's an incident. I mean, every day in the paper, you hear something about one of these lithium batteries going on fire. Are we going to wait till it happens on one of our trains or one of our subways, and then we're going to act? We need to be proactive, not reactive. And it's just something we got to move on. Um, then one other thing uh, regarding the schedule. Um, I sincerely hope that you can tweak this into acceptability. I personally have some doubts about that, but you're the professionals, and I hope you can get it done. But one thing that needs to be looked at immediately is the return to timed connections. Not so much in the morning, because like you've all said, there's a train going into either Penn or Madison, Madison, Grand Central Madison, every six to eight minutes, something like that. But on the way home, if you miss a timed connection to Port Jefferson, you miss a timed connection to Oyster Bay, even you miss a timed connection out you know, past Babylon, you could be waiting for an hour, and that's unacceptable. One of the things that we've done, and I'm sorry for the rant, is we've shot ourselves in the foot with all the publicity we did with the opening of Grand Central Madison because we kept telling everybody, this is going to be great. We're adding 40% more service. You know, so everybody... When that opening day came, everybody's coming with the anticipation that, wow, things are going to be so much better. And for a lot of our commuters, it wasn't so much better. It was actually worse. We broke a major business law. We failed to manage our clients' expectations, and our riders are our clients. And now we have to try and, you know, salvage this. 
Whether we can or we can't, uh, I don't know, but we have to try and do something. I'm sorry for the rant, but this, is, this has been building up for a while with me. Can I respond? Uh, so, can I just go very quickly? Uh, so so I, I guess, Jerry, just briefly with respect to uh, to to the the horrendous assault on our on our two employees um, you know we've been working very closely with chief Mueller and his team with respect to the ban that you've discussed right we had an earlier incident where another conductor was assaulted working through those issues trying to be very aggressive and proactive with respect to taking actions against people who would perpetrate such horrible crimes so I think you know you've got a leader in chief Mueller and his senior team and and and, and in me as well frankly uh, working with the unions, working with whoever we need to work with to make sure that, you know, people who commit crimes like this are, are you know, appropriately and severely punished for their crimes. So that, that that's, that's a commitment that we all share. Um, with respect to the Grand Central Madison service plan, you, you know, listen, I, I think that there's a lot that was exciting about the service plan. There are a lot of people in Grand Central Madison who are very happy with, with how their commutes have changed. But to your point, we need to work with those customers who are not so happy to see what we can do within the, the infrastructure that we have, the equipment that we have, uh, to be able to provide everybody with a positive experience, and and that's that's a you know a commitment that the entire leadership team at the Long Island Railroad shares. Thank you, Co-Chair Chu has a comment followed by Commissioner Brown, I think, and oh, Commissioner Glucksman. Yes. <clears throat> sure. First on the on the Grand Central Madison rollout, um, everyone acknowledges it was a um, rocky start. Um, and I think there's still quite a bit to figure out. I think everyone acknowledges that as well. Um, you know, I read in the paper this morning about the, you know, some of the accessibility concerns we, we need to iron out. Um, but I will say, um, you know, and I've been getting, you know, pr pretty regular updates, um, you know, and a lot of information. People have been coming out of the woodwork, people that I worked with 20 years ago. Um, they weren't shy in finding me when they had specific issues. And I, I just want to applaud, you know, everyone that was, you know, I know working very diligently around the clock to respond um, and, you know, in a dynamic situation to make sure that we can improve it in real time and, you know, over time, make sure we just get everything settled in. Um, you know, the, but, you know, the people that felt that the most were, you know, our frontline workers. And I have to say, even before the Grand Central Madison rollout, I've been riding the system you know, much more frequently, especially coming in for, for our meetings. Um, I even, you know, I, I looked up my number. I saw some, there was an article about how much you use your Metro card, your board Metro card. And I, I wasn't at the bottom, but so, so I think as a Long Islander, that was a victory. Um, but, uh, you know, riding the rail, especially when I've been riding trains, you know, in the off hours, when I come in the evenings, I can't, I, I can't point to a, a, mo a time, a ride, you know, where I haven't had to see a conductor deal with something, right? You know, where where it was just a routine course of business where, you know, everyone, oh, tickets, 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 you know. Um, I, I'm more likely to see that on on, on, the, on the rush hour train that I took in this morning to Grand Central, uh, which was a lovely ride. And, but on these off hours, every every time, either someone that doesn't have a fare, someone that is, is, is not, and, you know, doesn't have their wits about them or, you know, is outright belligerent or has an attitude. Um, and I, I, I know a lot's being done. I know a lot of attention has been paid to public safety. I will say, you know, I want to compliment. It's, you know, in this case, we can't do it enough. Compliment um, Suffolk District Attorney Ray Tierney, who was the first district attorney in the state to exercise, you know, that ban, that, that ability to ban a rider. Um, perhaps, you know, there's there's merit to looking into, you know, a pre-conviction, you know, ban. Um, I mean, there's certainly other things that, you, you know, I, I, I think we, we cannot be exhaustive enough when it comes to, you know, public safety. The, all of these workers who have facilitated this unprecedented expansion of our, our rail, you know, have to deal with you know, I think it's unacceptable all of the things they've had to do that have assailed their dignity, you know, as, you know, people have felt an invitation to, you know, let civility, you know, go go the other way. But when it comes to public safety, you should not, you know, wake up in the morning with a pit in your stomach because you think you may be attacked or worse at work. That is just a condition that we can't allow to continue. Um, and I will say this, I know uh, the Chief's been on this, I, I know Kathy, I know your team's been on this. I'll say as a board member on this particular issue, 
I don't think I think from our responsibility, and I feel this personally. Like I, I can't know enough, so I would really like to know more about this. Um, and so, you know, from Vinny um, and from management, I think this is something that really would like to know more about one what what the what the workers are recommending, what they see as potential solutions that would make them feel safer, um, and also, you know, s some of the things that were you know, we're, we're thinking about implementing to just continue to make them safer. And even if it's external, if it's something that, you know, we've been talking a lot about advocacy for the budget, you know, perhaps there's policies that we could look to and ask for our own, you know, you know, governor and state legislature to enact that can help make our, our workforce feel safer and, 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 and prevent heinous, you know, crimes like this from happening again. Thank you, Co-Chair Chu. Um, I completely agree with that. I think it should be a pleasant and safe ride, not just for our riders, but also for our frontline staff. Um, I believe Commissioner Glexman had a comment. Yes. I, I wanted to support all of Vinny's concerns and Jerry's concerns about the crews and they need to be protected. And um, the e-scooter thing, we had a presentation from Pat at PCAC this month. I can't wait for rules to come out. I mean, those things are scary, as Maldiva said, and Dory said, they were all here in the newspaper about the fires and the deaths. We need to do something, and it's gotta be quick, and we waited long enough about this. Thank you. Commissioner Valdivia. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair. Um, you know, Co-Chair Chu, um, agree with your statements, so thank you for making them. Um, I had a question about Grand Central Madison. Um, so, you know, as a uh, as a city member, you know, I've been really focused on uh, the, the lack of the one-seat ride to Brooklyn. So, one, um, appreciate the staff um, answering my questions, answering, because I know a lot of things happen behind the scenes that maybe not everybody knows. I know a lot of people in this room have had a lot of conversations with Kathy um, over the weeks, so really appreciate kind of the staff responsiveness on that. I guess my remaining question is, and I think I've asked this before and there was a public comment on it, I understand um, the nature of the Brooklyn shuttle and that you're increasing, head, uh, sorry, decreasing headways for the Brooklyn shuttle from Jamaica to Brooklyn, so that's great, um, but this, issue of, I believe the Brooklyn shuttle leaves from track 11 to 12. And can you tell me if there's any thinking in the future about um, that, you know, that kind of walk and that length to walk through? Is that is that a really big kind of customer inconvenience? Um, what are the complaints that you're hearing about those tracks versus other tracks and what is operationally feasible? So I'll, I'll start, and if Rob wants to jump in, he can do that. So, so Platform F, which is where tracks 11 and 12 are located, w w was actually you know a project that was constructed as part of the East Side Access project. So, uh, you know the Brooklyn shuttle operation had always, and, and I know you know this, had always been an element of the service plan, just because of the the crossing over of the physical plant at Jamaica, and since we're going to be increasing service so much through the Jamaica complex, that was why 11 and 12 were constructed as a way of keeping that, uh, keeping uh, essentially providing for a more reliable service as well for, for those customers because it's sort of unencumbered by everything else that's happening within the Jamaica plant. So there are a limited number of through trains still in the morning. There, there's, you know, there's four through trains in the morning and then we've got that, you know, those complement the shuttle trains. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, continuing to have the shuttle operation from 11 and 12, uh, you know, continues to be, you know, sort of a, you know, part of the, the operation operating plan and the service plan for for you know the full the full range of service running through Jamaica in the morning um, that being said we've been very very focused and I, I know you know this as well on wayfinding and other improvements to make it easier for people to know where they're going I do think that it was a tremendous adjustment for our Brooklyn customers the first couple of weeks they just were not used to this um, so we're really focused on making improvements with respect to how they navigate that space how that shuttle service is being operated so that it feels a lot more more like, for example, the Times Square shuttle, where you've got that predictability. You see a train across the platform. If the train doors close on one side, you've got the trains on the other. The service frequencies have increased significantly. So that helps a lot with respect to kind of reinforcing the overall predictability and regularity of that service. And so thank you for reminding me that track 11 and 12 was part of kind of the concept of operations mm -hmm. for Eastside Access and 
in central Madison. So you anticipate that um, for for the foreseeable future, you'll mm -hmm. have the Brooklyn yes. shuttle out of 11 yes. and 12. That's the concept of operations. Yes. Okay. So then um, you'll do wayfinding and all of that. Mm -hmm. And are you still planning to keep these kind of seven and a half minute headways, Rob, that you were talking about? I think that's where some of the shuttle is um, in terms of headways in the peak. Yeah, I mean, that, that's okay. roughly the, the headways in the peak are, you know, in that okay. eight minutes or and so And what are range. the headways in the off-peak? Half hour? Yeah, it's 20 minutes in the off-peak. There minutes, used to be two trains an hour, now okay. there's three trains an hour. And is there any sense of increasing the number of through trains from four to six in the peak or anything like that? Well, the problem becomes yeah. throughput, right? We've yeah. expanded service to such a degree that the, the ability to operate through trains would significantly reduce yeah. our ability to move trains through Jamaica just okay. in terms of their ability to cross over and, and get there. And, and without getting into the weeds, I think one of the issues becomes th that the fact that we serve five western terminals, right, there's not many properties that mm -hmm. do that. So now who do you have across the platform when you're serving five terminals? We can't have five trains at one time. They couldn't yeah. all be across the platform yeah. from each other. And this, you know, the time delay it takes to move those trains through Brooklyn are significant impediments to the operation. No, and I, and I really appreciate it. I understand that, you know, you all recognize, oh, this is a challenge. Mm -hmm. We're going to make adjustments to address the challenges, especially as it relates to Brooklyn service. So I appreciate that work and that responsiveness. Thank you. Thank I, you. I think just something to add to that, where, you know, Kathy had mentioned some of the shorter term things, but we've put together a working group to look at what are some longer term things that we can do to help with the, mm -hmm. that type of the service as far as walking over. So, you know, whether that's f future capital programs and whatnot, we don't, you know, it's all being put together now to look at it for the future. Commissioner Brown had a comment followed by Commissioner Borelli. Yeah, I, don't, I get that, you know, you've piled so much stuff up now. I'm, unlike Vinny, I'm someone who talks all the time. <laughs> so, uh, but, but this, the uh, safety stuff, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to find a s subject that's more, um, can, more important today than, um, than safety. The, um, I'd like to point out among things that, uh, regarding safety on Metro North, uh, according to the, um, documents here, the r reports this month, you're, uh, like 12 percent short on staffing of the safety department in Metro North, and you know, without asking you why, I mean, to describe something why why this is, which I'm you know curious why you, five percent would seem bad enough, but you know, 12 percent is a very high uh, percentage on something that there's so much concentration of uh, resources on that. Um, it seems on Metro North often that you're forgotten because you haven't had a crisis. And we have had crises, and it's not, I was talking to Benny before, and the, um, are we, we just seem to wait for these huge, dangerous incidents to drive our policy making, not just on safety, but on other, other, uh, um, other transportation related things. But, but, um, what, what gets me and, and, Vinny will tell you this too, there's really not a single conductor that goes through a single trick um, shift without uh, some sort of confrontation with somebody. And you're an authority figure, you're on there, you're the only authority figure. And I suggest when you come up with the um, lifetime bans, most of that banning control is going to be done by the conductor. So you're just building more and more confrontations into the system. Now, uh, I do have an additional safety uh, issue with the, uh, you know, nobody, everybody's um, suspicious of the lithium batteries, but uh, we provide charging for them on the, on, on the trains to, so they're, they're able to charge on the train. So um, we're, again, we're feeding our own problem. And um, I know it's hard. Everybody's trying to figure it out. This uses a lithium battery. That uses a lithium battery. They can all blow up under some certain circumstances. And it's, uh, you know, again, it's all going to fall on a conductor to whatever you decide to do with the, with the uh, bikes, with the, uh, with the uh, unruly passengers. It's all going to fall on the conductor. And they, and they have more and more built into um, confrontation. And um, then 
I have an additional practical question here as a union representative. I, you know, I kind of cringe when I see the word volunteer come up on, on, I mean, it's nice you got people that are so involved to volunteer to do things. Um, but the, that Grand Central um, or the Madison Avenue shed has been a mess for, I don't know, I've only been doing this for 35 years and it's always been a mess. And I don't understand why we don't have employees responsible for that. Um, and that, again, maybe we can't hire people. Maybe you need to raise wages. Maybe you need to offer some other sort of incentives to get people to do it. But if you're depending on people to volunteer to do these safety critical um, operations, there's nothing against the volunteers. Very well-meaning people. I don't know where you draw them from. Um, but. Um, there, it's not the same as taking the responsibility of having your own employee out there trying to um, do their thing. And um, it's about all that. Please go ahead and respond to that, and then we can go. Okay. Yeah, maybe working backwards, and then we can. So, so with respect. That's okay. Um, so with respect to the cleanups, it's sort of a bit of both, Norman, right? I mean, you know, we have maintenance away, uh, you know, forces who deal with, who do cleanups and, you know, they'll work with, we have, you know, rights of, right of ways, rights of way task forces at both railroads who will, in, who will work with MW with safety on certain, you know, key locations that we, you know, where cleanups are necessary. So that's a very kind of targeted thing. But, you know, both railroads have sort of special cleanup campaigns uh, for, you know, shops or, you know, certain problem locations. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of both. It's not one or the other. Um, with respect to your observations about, since we're on a roll about safety, um, the vacancy rates generally, you know, this is something that I know you know about because we've spoken about this a lot. I mean, Metro North has high vacancy rates in a number of different departments. Safety is not the only one, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to be proactive. We don't want to wait for, you know, whatever the next thing is. We want to be proactive with respect to our staffing. We're working very, very, you know, collaboratively with the People Tower, with our business partners to try to get our hiring needs met as quickly as possible because we need to be appropriately staffed uh, and uh, you know that is a that is a huge organizational priority and uh, you know we, we make every effort to be proactive with respect to how we run the railroad and ensuring that you know that we don't have to have one of those conversations at some point down the line thank you um, I'd like to add my support to Finney and all our employees I mean I think a lot's been said I know Tom short I won't go on but I think we all know that our employees are a vital part of our service to our customers, but more importantly, they're part of our family. And you wouldn't let anything like this happen to a family member. And we should do whatever we can, whatever resources, however extreme they may be, to protect our family. Thank you. Just one last comment. You know, for a lot of our customers, they're, the conductor that they see on their train every day is really the only railroad employee that they see, they know. So that relationship that they form with their conductor, to a large extent, will define their view of the railroad. So these frontline employees, you know, bear a tremendous burden with respect to, uh, you know, the impression of the entire service, and they get a lot of the heat when the service isn't what they, what you know, what the customers have a right to expect. So, uh, you know, again, I want to reinforce and reiterate our commitment to ensuring that that frontline workforce who is out there every day creating a great impression of Metro North, a great impression of Long Island, that they get the protection and the support that they need in terms of how they do their jobs. Thank you. Yes. I, I thought about mentioning this before, but I didn't. Um, magnif to make this kind of magnifies what Vinny was bringing up, my first job in transit was in 1972 as a B Division conductor. And we had R1 to 9s and the R10s. And the conductor had to stand between the cars, open and close the doors. My biggest fear back then was being spit at. Now you can see how things, how times have changed. So it's a really serious matter. And I think you know, all the work that you guys did to apprehend these criminals is commendable. But someone needs to speak to the judges to make sure that someone like that doesn't get out so quickly. And thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to safety reports. Oh, OK, sure. Operations report. Justin will go first. Sure. Good morning. The operations report begins on page 14. System light on time performance for the month of February was 97.3%, above goal of 94%. 
Year-to-date on-time performance also reigns, remains above goal at 97.8%. There were two major incidents that negatively impacted OTP during the month of February. On February 9th, an infrastructure-related issue impacted trains arriving in the departing Grand Central Terminal, resulting in 33 late trains. And on February 17th, a speed restriction was put in place to repair track defects found by Sperry, resulting in 102 late trains. Regarding fleet, the mean distance between failures for January was nearly 600,000 miles, above the monthly goal of 175,000 miles. Let me know if we change the time and uh, tell them that. Mr. Mack, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting your, muting yourself, thank you. Go ahead, Jess. All right, and finally, this week, Metro North will be hosting the biannual NORAC conference for the first time in our history. NORAC is a body of railroads that established a set of operating rules for railroads in North America, predominantly in the Northeast. It is comprised of commuter railroads, class ones, and short line railroads. That concludes the report, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner Brown. Yeah, um, regarding MDVF and the, uh, in the uh, 300% jump in MDBF between December and January. I normally don't pay that much attention to these little glitches. I'm looking for more of a long-term improvement in these in these things. But what explains uh, um, that much increase, or do you have anything that explains, attempts to explain that such a huge increase in uh, exciting um, uh, <laughs> increase in MDBF, and ideally it stays at 600,000 miles. It's just sort of unbelievable compared to where we were, uh, certainly when I started in the trade. But, but um, how did how did that happen? How did how did we go from, you know, two hundred thousand in one month up to? I mean, did the weather get that good? And um, so the weather was actually very good in January. Um, it was more favorable than we typically see. Um, we also see really good performance with the M8, which drives up that number. Um, we have challenges with some of our other equipment, like the BL20s. I mean, the MDBF in those areas is about 20,000, so it really varies by fleet type. But um, the major reason for the increase is because of the good weather. Moving on to Long Island Rail. Rob? Hey. Good morning. Total on-time performance for the month of February was 95%, and year-to-date as of February was 96.4%. Nine of our branches operated at or above goal, and year-to-date as of February, all branches have operated at or above goal. For major events, which result in 10 or more late trains, there were 11 incidents for the month of February, the most significant of which occurred on February 27th during the AM commission hour. Uh, which re was a result of a, a loss of a signal supervisory system in Jamaica. This incident <laughs> negatively impacted on-time performance by 0.3%, and unfortunately it coincided with the launch of our Grand Central Madison service. Um, for our fleet performance, our MDBF for the month of January and year-to-date <clears throat> was 238,279 miles, above goal of 170,000 miles. For our fleet uh, uh, excuse me, for service delivery, we completed 99.7% of our trips for month to date and year to date. And upcoming work, which will impact service on Saturday, April 8th, there'll be maintenance work taking place between Valley Stream and Jamaica Station on the Montauk Branch. This will impact West Hempstead, Babylon, and Montauk Branch schedules, which will be adjusted. And on the weekends of April 15th, 16th, and April 22nd and 23rd, uh, to support DOT Van Wick widening work, um, Schedules for the Hempstead branch will either terminate or originate in Jamaica Station or Atlantic Terminal, and West Hempstead branch trains will originate or terminate in Grand Central Madison. Other schedules for other branches will be affected as well. Uh, please look at the website and the train time app for schedule updates, and that concludes my report. I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions for Rob? If not, we're moving on to safety reports. Shelley Prettyman will give the Metro North safety report. So good morning. Metro North safety report can be found on page 18 of the committee book. And first to look at the customer employee injury rates. This compares the current 12-month reporting period ending January 2023 to the rates for the prior 12 months ending January 2022. The reportable customer injury rate increased from 1.87 to 2.28 per 1 million customers, and the reportable employee lost time injury rate increased from 2.05 to 2.11 per 200,000 working hours. But I do want to note that these rolling 12-month rates have been trending downward over the past four months. Uh, 
Metro North held our first quarter safety focus week from March 6th through 12th. Throughout the week, managers held interactive discussions with employees on topics including the stop, look, assess, manager slam technique to prevent workplace incidents and injuries, and out three, outreach through the track's public safety education program in March focused on safe behaviors when boarding and detraining, as well as grade crossing safety awareness. An outreach was conducted at Milford, Peekskill, and Valhalla stations and at Hudson Avenue grade crossing in Peekskill. Uh, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Shelley? If not, we move on to Lori's report for Long Island Rail. Thanks. Good morning. So I appreciate the robust conversation that we've had about safety this morning. We're reporting on our performance through January of 2023, and that can be found on page 28, and happy to answer any questions folks may have. Lori, just because of the conversation that we had uh, uh, so far this morning, can, in the future, can we highlight the employee loss time and injury time relative to assaults and trauma from these harassments and assaults? So we can, you know, the, the board, see, the committee seems more interested in the information. Those numbers uh, are pretty impactful, I think. So just for the future. Any other questions? If not, we move on to Chief Mueller, who will give the MTA police report. Thank you, President Rinaldi. Uh, for the month of February 2023, we had 23 uh, major felonies in our, uh, our MTA system. Uh, of those, 17 were grand larcenies. We had one robbery, two burglaries, and we had three assaults. And so I think it speaks to what we were talking about earlier about the impact that these these incidents have on us. You know, we're talking about 23 felonies overall and 17 of which are grand larcenies. And of the 17 uh, of the grand larcenies, 12 of them were unattended property. So it's something that we continue to deal with. We're trying to get the word out and trying to work on that. Just to speak a little bit about uh, what, what occurred last Wednesday, um, obviously, uh, the MTA PD shares the sentiments of everybody at the table. It's it's refreshing to hear, you know, the support of our our MTA employees. It's um, since ever since I've been here, I feel like we are really truly a family. And when we have family members get affected like this, and and that extends to our ridership, that you know we take this very seriously. And it's very important for us to to support and and make our our community safe. Community being our track workers, our conductors, our station managers. Uh, everybody who's in the system that make the system so good. We have tremendous support from Chairman Lieber, who's been very, you know, very helpful with all these types of things. But again, what you need with these type of things is an end-to-end -end solution. Um, you know, as as uh, Vinny said, you, you know, the MTA detectives under the uh, supervision of Detective Sergeant Ed Russell uh, had a 24-hour turnaround time with this arrest, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't really thank the Kings County District Attorney's Office because they were absolutely fantastic. In particular, I'm going to name Kevin Albach, who worked all day with our detectives to make sure that we got this to where it needed to be. In the end, I think really we're, we're, we've, we've gotten away from victims and, and the, in, the exponential effect that this has on, on people when they're, when they're subjected to an assault like this. It's not just them, it's their families. It's the people that witnessed it that were on the train that day. It's it's also, um, you know, the countless people that see it on video. And in the end, there has to be consequences. So I, I would ask everybody to just continue to advocate, support us. We're very, like I said, very grateful for the board, uh, very grateful for Chairman Lieber and his support um, so we can make this as safe and secure as possible. There has to be an end-to-end -end solution. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief. Any questions for Chief Miller? Yes, Commissioner Brigham. Yeah, <clears throat> Chief. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, we just heard in the paper about a, a grand larceny that took place back in January, uh, and I guess you had problems finding this, these perpetrators. Uh, there were three of them. Why did it take two months, though, for you to release it to the press for your assistance? Wouldn't it have been a couple of weeks after the, after the fact? Or, I mean, two months seems like a long time. Like the trail's probably gone cold, I would think. Not necessarily. There, there's a lot to go into that investigative process. I'd have to actually look at the at, at the case and the fact pattern to find out, you know, exactly what happened. In general, we try to get the information out as quickly as possible. So there may have been some some other factors there that that decide not to. But I'm happy, more than happy to get back to you with with the specific information to that case. 
You know, because when I saw it this morning, it was like, holy crap, when did this happen? You know, and I'm looking and it's like January 29th. It's March. <laughs> you know, it's, um, I'm sure you had reasons. I was just kind of curious. You know, I would have thought you would have reached out to the public a lot, a lot sooner. Um, that's just my opinion. Absolutely. But. We'll take a look. Okay. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you. I just wanted to emphasize that that we you know this 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 event with the conductors was horrific and it is you know just something that just breaks our heart and and we put a lot of effort into trying to to fix it i think that what we heard here today and, and i and i uh, totally agree with uh, what uh, commissioner brown talked about and being you know not waiting for an, for a, an incident before we do something and and i think we've been really doing that i just want people to, to uh you know remind ourselves about all the things that are going on right now too um, that are proactive we are out there working the bands um, which um, is as there's a couple already uh, on Long Island Railroad there's five out there that are there for different reasons right now which is great um, we are we are working um, with more patrols more patrols are on the trains right now which, so we are looking at that and how to improve that every day we're working with the DAs and trying and talking to them and, and trying to fight through um, them releasing people or charging people or while all the processes go through that some of these things are um, and, and, and we talked about the PEB policy which we totally um, uh, understand and want to get it out too we want we have to do smart due diligence on that one because it's going to be so um, uh, important and long-lasting we don't want to do it twice um, and, and so that's about ready to come out. We'll put it out next month, as um, at least that's the current plan at the next board meeting. Um, so we're very proactive on all these things. Um, some of our works in progress, some are, um, are done, and some of them are going to require a lot of vigilance on our part to keep up with them, like working with the courts, right? So um, I just commend everybody here for the, for the heart everybody's putting into it, and we, we're with you 100%, and we're trying to be proactive and get after all those issues that you, you brought up, so thank you. Yes, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, and, and not to try to pin you guys down so much. I, just, I don't get that far in Long Island. I get Jamaica's about as far as I get in Long Island usually. Um, but when I'm in Jamaica, I always take a look at that air train building and try to count how many homeless people are sleeping or laying on the floor in some what appears to me to be some level of dis personal distress. I don't know. But there's always, I mean, it's, a, it's like, like an encampment right outside the police department uh, facility. So obviously it's a jurisdictional thing. The Port Authority guys, I mean, what are you guys doing teamed up with Port Authority to address that? Have you had any success in, I mean, I notice a few familiar faces too when I go through there. Um, and I, it seems to be a particular location where we have particular um, I've, I've wondered how you've kept it out of the press with so much concentration on, you know, how people got from one track to the other. And, and did they ever talk about, you know, if you went 20 feet further, they'd fall over a homeless guy? Or um, how are you dealing with that? Are we improving ours? I mean, again, I'm looking for a trajectory where we're having improvement rather than any particular incidents. But it looks pretty dangerous to me. Yeah, no, uh, Commissioner Brown, it's, it's the right way to look at it, that it, you know, it's, it's not a one-off or it's one day. It's the trending. Where are we going with the trending? So what we are doing is we are working with the Port Authority to come up with a solution that we can all take part in. Um, obviously, you know, be, you know, as you mentioned, jurisdictional problems, but that, that shouldn't be too much of a roadblock. We all have to, you know, aspire to the same thing, which is what that at the, the terminal or the air train area is not meant to sleep or to shelter in. It's a transportation facility. And so we'll be working with the Port Authority more on that. We've had success in other terminals that we hope to replicate there with our homeless outreach, our 958 nurses, um, and, and the other assets that we bring with us so that it's, it's kind of a holistic solution. So hopefully we'll have some uh, good news for you in the next couple of months. Similar to what you've done in Penn. Exactly. Yeah. We've. Um, gotten with all the police departments there we have a you know a very robust uh, coordination effort at that place and it's made a difference that you've noticed yeah I, I think just one last thing I think it goes to uh, you know the chairman's philosophy that you know we have a, a very not stubborn but a consistent group of folks that continue to use a system that in some cases are severely mentally ill uh, severely addicted to drugs. So when we focus on those people and seeing how we can get them into long-term care, it's, 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 again, it's, it's a solution that 
kind of discounts the idea of just putting them on an ambulance twice a day every day because that's not really doesn't seem to be solving the problem so you know looking at these people for their entire uh, history whether it's criminal or psychiatric history gives us a better idea of how we can really stand this up and get them get them into long-term care yeah did any of your frequent flyers from Penn when you got when you when you brought the level of uh, homeless disruption there at Penn down. Did any of them wash up in Jamaica as individuals? I'd have to check because we, are, again, because we're, we are, um, you know, we're, we're person centric in this, in this type of uh, strategy. So I'd have to look, but it's entirely possible. It may not be likely, you know, again, it's, it's an interesting thing. And that's, you know, speaks also to the point of how important it is to get as much information as we can about people so we can see where they're going and seeing if what we're doing, like, as far as not necessarily tracking them, but keeping an eye on what the behavior is. If the, is the behavior approving after treatment? Is it not approving? Um, are we can are we changing conditions? And and as you mentioned earlier, it's all about the trending. Yeah, I suggest that the information is a, is a stronger weapon than than the punishment for these particularly mentally ill people. I don't believe they're really afraid of punishment. Um, and I do think more information you have about them. Um. Commissioner, just on that note, um, we're going a little deep in this, but we do have, um, we work with a city in a big effort for the last uh, nine, ten months now, um, and we've identified what we call the top 50 of these individuals across the city, but mostly across our subway system and our railroads. And we track them very closely, and we know who they are, and when they, if they show up somewhere else, we have a teams ready to go go deal with them, teams of nurses, teams of police, teams of uh, you know, staff, et cetera, to go work on. So we're real robust effort trying to get these, uh, these, this group of people that are sort of the hardcore and really need help. Thank you. We need to move this meeting forward. One additional question from Commissioner Brown, and then we have to continue. Okay. Commissioner Brown. Excuse me, Commissioner Brown. Actually, I've been kind of critical this whole meeting, so I just want to put something positive out there. Uh, you mentioned Penn Station, and I have seen a real, real improvement over the last two, three months in Penn Station. And I could see it's the way you deploy your people. I had uh, complained a couple of months back about this, the central corridor at Penn. And now I notice you usually have a cop's stationed right by where the main thoroughfare is, where the concourse, and then you have one of your little golf carts down the other end with somebody. So. Obviously, there's nobody in there. So uh, what you're doing in Penn Station is really working. Um, to uh, Commissioner Browns, I think they washed up on the subway because <laughs> there was probably three guys in this first subway car I got on this morning, but no, none in Penn. So I thank you for that effort. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and it, it, all the credit goes to uh, Deputy Inspector uh, Zinga Kelman and her men and women of, of the 4th District. Uh, they, they work very hard every day. Thank you. Um, Kathy, are there any action items for the committee? Yeah, there is one action item. It's the Grand Central Madison Terminal Rules of Conduct, which is in the book. Um, President Rob Troop is here in case there's any questions about this action item. Any questions? Um, I, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, may I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. This item carries. Mm -hmm. Kathy, can you take us through information items? Sure. So there are two Metro North information items, the annual elevator and escalator report and the March schedule change, and two uh, Long Island Railroad information items, again, the annual elevator and escalator report and the spring track work program. Are there any questions about these information items? I had a quick question. With the list of um, elevators for Metro North, I didn't see Porchester's elevator at least in the package that I had. Was that because it's not under Metro North's or? That's an excellent question. Can we get back to you on that, given the press of Absolutely, time? Absolutely, yes, <laughs> okay. definitely. And moving on to any other questions on the reports? Okay, um, agency finance reports, Kathy? Yeah, the, the finance reports are in the book, um, if there's any questions. And then we have one Long Island Railroad procurement. Richard Mack is here to just run through that very quickly. Good morning. The Long Island Railroad has uh, seeks MTA board approval to award a competitively solicited contract to the firm Railware for the purchase and installation of a rail traffic control system software to replace the existing software system at the Jamaica Central Control 
which was installed in 2010, and it's beyond its useful life. The software will be purchased and installed for a negotiated price of $2,299,063 and will be installed over a 24-month period. Once installed, the railroad will have system greater system reliability and also will achieve an annual savings of 164000 annually, which is the current cost to maintain the existing system software that is beyond its useful life. I present this to the board for its approval. Thank you. May I have a motion? motion. And a second? second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. So moved. Um, and um, this leaves us with the adjournment. May I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting? Motion second. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.